right, welcome everyone. We'll give everyone a few minutes to join in on the webinar. Emily, how do you want to, um, is, uh, is that Ariel that's got um, control of the slides or how's that working? It's, uh, it's actually me now. So, oh, okay. uh, so yeah, when we get to your part of the uh, presentation, you can just uh, tell me like next slide or something like okay. that and I'll, and I'll move it forward. Okay. I think I'll just maybe wait one more minute. I just got a couple other people, I think, coming in. All right, so I think it's 7.03 now. I think we'll get started. All right, so good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Belmore Creek uh, Community Feedback Meeting. We're really excited to have you all here tonight with us to look over the three different alternative fish passage options for Mill Pond at Belmore Creek. Um, just to go over a little bit of housekeeping, you probably all know Zoom by now, but uh, we are in a webinar platform, so please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A feature or the chat box, and we'll try to answer those either throughout the meeting or we'll have some time at the end as well. This meeting is also being recorded and we're going to be posting that on the CTUG website um, sometime after the meeting. So if you miss it or have to leave early, we will have it available there as well. Uh, so to introduce myself, my name is Emily Hall. I'm a conservation policy advocate with SeaTech Environmental Association, and I'm excited to be joined by Enrico Nardone, our executive director, um, Ariel Santos, our policy program coordinator, as well as the Princeton Hydro team, our fantastic consultant that's working with us on the design for the fish patches options. And they'll be introducing themselves in just a minute. And also Daniel Fucci from Nassau County, and he'll um, be saying a few words in a moment as well. All right, so let's get started. Uh, for today's uh, meeting and presentation, we'll just go over some brief introductions about each of our organizations and kind of what we do and our roles in the project. Then we'll go over the project background and the goals of the project, a bit about the project overview, the process, the three different alternatives, and kind of where our um, uh, the different results are so far for that. And then we'll have some Q&A and closing remarks. And I'll also provide some different um, forms and links for everyone to uh, provide feedback after the meeting on the three alternatives. Okay. So to just give a little bit of an intro on SeaTech Environmental Association, if you aren't familiar with us, we're a 501c3 uh, nonprofit dedicated to conserving Long Island wildlife and the environment. And we do this through conservation projects and habitat restoration projects like the one we're doing right now at Belmore Creek. We also do a lot of engagement with community science around Long Island, community scientists to um, find different wildlife around the island, kind of where they are and um, just kind of the status of different populations. And then we also do a lot with um, education, uh, environmental education for Long Islanders of all ages. So we're very excited to be a part of this project today. 
So the project background, um, in 2018, uh, CTEC received the New York, uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation uh, grant the, um, just look at this, Division of Marine Resources grant for tributary restoration resiliency to design fish passage at Belmore Creek. Uh, the two main goals of this project is to one, restore connectivity and ecological health of Belmore Creek, and then the second to restore fish passage of river herring. So there's two different types of river herring, alewife and blueback herring. And I'll get to the importance of river herring in just a moment, but the reason we need to restore passage is because the dam at Mill Pond is currently blocking them from moving upstream into their spawning habitat. Uh, the different products that will come from this grant um, process and this uh, program that we're doing will be the alternative analysis that we're going to be talking about tonight. So Princeton Hydro helped us design three different alternative fish passage options for Mill Pond and Belmore Creek. Then we'll go into the, de the design planning phase. We'll go as far as we can with the remaining budget we have, so we'll likely get to maybe somewhere um, around a 30% design, depending on the option that we choose. And then we'll also have a engineering and construction cost estimate for the project. Just show this little video here. So why is this project important? Uh, river herring transfer really important ocean derived energy from our local estuaries into our coastal streams. So they're diadromous fish, meaning that they live part of their life in salt water and part of their life in fresh water. So basically the adults will live out their lives in the ocean and each year they'll come back, uh, swim through our local estuaries and into our coastal streams to spawn. And along the way, they get eaten up by a host of different other animals and species, including everything from dolphins and large sport fish to otters and coastal birds, including ospreys as they enter our local estuaries and streams. So they're a really foundational species to the food web and super important to supporting all sorts of other wildlife. So basically restoring connectivity, um, will one, increase the population, but also bring back a host of other wildlife to Belmore Creek that will, um, that will eat them. Um, so as I mentioned before, they're currently being blocked um, from moving upstream into their spawning habitat by the spillway at Mill Pond. And when they're blocked, their spawning success will actually reduce over time. That's why their populations will drastically dwindle. And that's why um, in order to increase our population and to help them thrive, we wanna move them upstream into their freshwater habitat, which is their ideal spawning habitat. All right. So now I'll just go over a little bit about the site. You can see the spillway there. So you see that dam there basically blocks any fish from moving upstream. Um, we'll move up and into the pond now. As we move over, you can see some of the neighborhoods nearby. You can also see Wantaw Parkway. And to talk just briefly about the history of the site, um, the site back in the day used to support a number of different mills and kind of early colonial sediment, um, settlements. Then moving on in years, it also supported and provided some water to New York City through Brooklyn Water Works. And then the current spillway is not um, actually the results of like an old mill or anything. And that is from a 1970s road improvement project. Um, so that is a little bit more of a modern spillway than just a mill site. Um, so the stream has been changed over time in the pond as well. And that is the resulting environment right now as it stands. And I just want to say too, you can see there is some sedimentation in the stream, so that will um, provide the opportunity for host of um, aquatic plants and invasive aquatic plants to take place, um, just in case you're wondering what that is. And there's actually a invasive pull um, at Mill Pond this coming Friday, and if anyone's interested, I can talk a little bit more about that at the end as well. All right, so I just wanted to move quickly in the video to look at the dam again. So you can see the spillway. I'll move back a little for a clearer shot. So you can see in the upcoming spillway, they basically just sit right in the spillway and are unable to move upstream. So they might be spawning here, but the success is um, really, really reduced than if they were able to get into the upstream habitat. So that's basically the goal of the project. 
Okay. And how we kind of first approached this project is we wanted to um, put together an advisory committee that could really help us look at all the different elements of the project. Um, we uh, kind of brought together a group of local and state government entities, as well as environmental groups, um, the local Belmore Civic Association and other community members have been really helpful in kind of assessing all the different aspects of Belmore Creek, uh, the goals of the project, and then the different alternatives as well. And I just want to make note here that um, the feedback from the advisory committee and the public is very, very important and CTOC is carefully collecting all this information um, to kind of support and guide the decision. The property of Mill Pond is Nassau County property, um, so they will be the ones to ultimately kind of guide the final decision making process. Um, so if Dan um, Fucci is around, um, Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, so I just want to introduce um, Dan Fuji from Nassau County again. He's an environmental uh, analyst over at the county and to just welcome him to say a few words on kind of the county's role in the project and um, their perspective. All right, Dan. Uh, great. Great. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate that. And I just want to thank everybody for joining tonight. And the county is uh, uh, looking forward to continuing to work with CTUC and the, the advisory group uh, to come up with a uh, an ultimate uh, determination as to what type of fish passageway we will be installing here at the Mill Pond. Um, uh, as Emily was uh, uh, touching upon before, Mill Pond is uh, actually one of many uh, South Shore ponds in Nassau County that run along Merrick Road. And she was referring to a road improvement project, it's uh, Merrick Road. Uh, so all of our ponds uh, on the north side of Merrick Road have spillways, uh, Massapequa, uh, uh, Lake, uh, Milburn Pond, Lofts Pond, and, and of course Mill Pond that we're discussing. They all have very similar uh, spillway type uh, systems that were uh, installed during uh, that, that road uh, improvement project. Uh, getting back to Mill Pond, we're talking about a 15 acre pond. I believe the preserve is over 50 acres in size. Uh, it's a tremendous uh, asset and a resource to, to Nassau County. Our uh, Parks and Recreation Department oversees uh, the the uh, preserve and the pond itself. Uh, as Emily, Emily was discussing before, we are having a, uh, a water chestnut pole uh, this coming Friday. Um, yeah, Mill Pond uh, unfortunately has some, recently has some uh, management issues relative to invasive species uh, that, but, but we, the good news is the county is, uh, you know, looking to take charge of, of, of these issues, um, whether, you know, removing the water chestnut and reducing the amount of spatter dock. Now spatter dock, interestingly enough, is native, but I believe in the studies show that because of our nitrogen uh, problem here on, on, on Long Island with runoff, um, the, the spatter dock in our local ponds have, has, has exploded to the point where it's, it's really becoming an issue. If you look at Mill Pond today, I would say 50% at least of the pond is, is inundated with spatter dock and, and pretty much everywhere else where it's not, you have water chestnut uh, uh, infestation. Uh, the good news is uh, we're having the, the, uh, the poll on Friday, uh, but the county has uh, retained a, a contractor to come into Mill Pond in July to use a weed harvester to remove uh, water chestnut. And ultimately, we want to also tackle uh, via a, a recently approved uh, DEC permit to reduce the amount of spatter dock in there as well. And I think that'll uh, complement the fact that we want to create a fist passageway as well to get the river herring back up into Mill, Mill Pond. I think reducing those uh, that vegetation will uh, help uh, get the river herring uh, in there with, with the with the fish passageway. And I think with that reduced amount of vegetation, there'll be a, a better opportunity for spawning of the, of the river herring. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of issues right now with Mill Pond, but there's a lot of plans uh, that we're going to, you know, tackle these problems and, and, and really have a good management program for Mill Pond. So again, I don't want to take too much more time, but I do uh, want to thank again, Emily and Rico and their great work, CTUC and the advisory group. And I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's opinion tonight and thoughts on uh, what type of fish passageway we can uh, take a look at and perhaps consider. And then the county will take that information and evaluate it and go forward from there. So Emily, uh, thank you again. Uh, and everyone, thank you again for your time. And I'll stick around if there's any questions that are county re related. 
I'll be more than happy to entertain it, uh, those questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to pass it along to Paul Woodworth from Princeton Hydro, and he'll be going over um, kind of the larger project overview. Sure, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Dan. That was a really good introduction, background of all that. Um, I'll just, uh, we have to throw in a quick blurb about who we are, Princeton Hydro. We're a small engineering firm that focuses in water resources uh, management and restoration. Uh, we're based out of New Jersey, but we cover New England and the Northeastern all the way down to the sort of mid-Atlantic states. Um, and uh, we're very active in fish passage design and, and barrier removal projects. It's, it's an area we take a lot of interest in. So um, next slide. There we go. Okay, and uh, so our, we are a, a company that's sort of a, a mixture, a, a family of, uh, of engineers and scientists. Um, Jeff Gall is also on the, on the call today. We'll be around to answer some questions at the end. He's our engineer of record and the, and the principal or the uh, president of our firm. Um, but I'm, I was joined by a, a couple of my colleagues, uh, geomorphologists, aquatic ecologists, wetland scientists, uh, and our communications and uh, communication specialists and uh, engineers on this project. And, uh, I won't introduce everybody, but um, they're not all here tonight, but they were um, very helpful resources in, in this project up to date, up to this date. Next slide. So as Emily had said, we looked at uh, three different alternatives, a technical fishway, um, which you see pictured uh, there below, uh, which is more of a, a manufactured, pre-manufactured pre or prefabricated structure that's installed over the spillway. We also looked at the possibility of a nature-like fishway, which is uh, a fishway uh, created out of natural materials, mainly boulders and sometimes concrete, to create a step pool type um, uh, channel. And then we also looked at the dam, dam removal alternative, which uh, evolved into a, a dam lowering alternative. And, uh, and I'll get into that in a, in a little bit too. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick uh, sort of update on our current status here on the project. We, we started off this project in October of last year. We did our initial site visit right around Thanksgiving um, where we looked at the dam, the spillway. We did some sediment probing. We took a sediment sample. We investigated the water pipe network in the upstream side of the park. We looked at a lot of the bridges and the upstream reaches, used survey grade GPS uh, to GPS uh, locations and establish elevations. Um, so we covered a lot of ground in that first site visit. And next slide. Um, so we did look at this. Uh, Emily just gave a brief overview of this structure here. It's sort of a horseshoe shaped um, concrete structure with some stone facing. It's actually very, I'd say, was well designed and well uh, constructed. Uh, what, what you see on the left here is, uh, is the engineering design plans overlaid onto an aerial. And so what it indicates is a low level outlet that's below grade and extends up into the channel. There's also some rubble masonry that was at least proposed in the design. I can't quite, we didn't quite confirm that it was there. Um, and, but, and then you see that this is all tied into the Merrick Road crossing with the concrete uh, retaining walls on the side. Um, looking at the upper right, um, the, the gray hatch area shows how this dam is sort of constructed into two tiers. And so I'll, I'll be referring to an upper tier and then a, a, a transitional sort of platform to a lower tier. And then after that lower tier, it grades right into the culvert under Merrick Road. Um, looking at the lower right uh, image, it shows what that culvert does from a bird's eye perspective. Uh, it's, it's kind of a straight shot under Merrick Road. Uh, it actually has some other culverts that come in and join it, but then it takes a really hard left turn and a hard right turn before it uh, discharges into um, uh, Belmore Canal. And um, I guess really quickly, we uh, tidal fluctuation happens here and it rises all the way up um, to that uh, upper tier, just to the base of that upper tier. And that's, that's something we're in the process of monitoring with water level gauges because it, it has, a, um, has the effect, it has the ability to enhance the feasibility of, uh, of all of our alternatives. So uh, next slide, please. So while we were out in our first field investigation, we discovered two key uh, aspects of this site that um, strongly influenced the feasibility of, the, of these alternatives. 
One is that um, uh, probing, both surveying in the downstream uh, channel elevation and the, in the bottom of the dam and comparing that to the probing we did upstream in the pond, in the impoundment, uh, we realized that the, the channel underneath Merrick Road um, had been excavated down or dug deeper than um, probably was ever there naturally. So the channel uh, bottom under Merrick Road and the base of that dam is lower than the elevation of the pond, like the natural pond bottom. Um, the other thing we discovered is that as we were probing through the impoundment, we discovered two areas that were excavated quite deeply. And uh, we turned that information around to SeaTuck, and then we reached out to the, to the county and, and eventually secured um, plans that you see on the far, on the, on the lower right there that in fact indicate where there had been dredging done, right where we had encountered it in probing. And, and we learned later on that that dredging had been accomplished in 2007. And uh, both of these, these effects, um, but very much so the, the elevation uh, down at Merrick Road complicates the idea of dam removal um, because what it means is you're, if you were to remove the full vertical extent of the dam, which is typically what we aim to do in a dam removal project, in this case, it would be the top tier, the platform, and the bottom, bottom tier, all the way down to the invert of the culvert under Merrick Road, that would initiate head cutting upstream and into the pond that is, um, it would be unnatural and it would cause an erosion below the natural stream bottom or below the bottom of the, of the impoundment at, at, uh, at Belmore, so at, at Mill Pond. Um, and that head cutting is something that would be sort of excessive. It would be, it would be taking the site to a, a condition that's not like it used to be. Um, and then, of course, it would mobilize a lot of sediment that would go into the culvert, um, not something we want to do, um, and because we don't want to risk uh, blockage in that culvert, and, and obviously that would trigger uh, erosion um, making its way out to Belmore Canal, also something that was not, um, not something we're, it's something we're trying to avoid. Um, and Likewise, with the excavation and the impoundment, um, some of that excavation seemed rather deep, and that in itself could initiate um, head cutting upstream towards some of the bridges that support some of the um, some of the trail network that's there. So, um, next slide, please. So we took this information, um, presented it to CTUC, and um, and then decided to have a, a, a conference call with the, a subcommittee or a subgroup of the Belmore. Um, Belmore uh, Advisory Committee and uh, discussed this idea with them and, and ultimately decided to choose dam lowering in lieu of full dam removal. Um, dam lowering in this sense would mean finding an elevation, what that exact elevation is right now, we don't, we don't know at the moment, um, but taking the dam down to an elevation that is nearly equivalent to the original pond bottom and not going below the original pond bottom. And this in this way, we would prevent uh, head cutting from going up into Belmore, and yet we'd still be able to restore whatever uh, natural tidal fluctuation in water surface elevations had existed prior to the dam. So this means that we would leave that sill or some portion of that of that lower tier of the dam in place. Um, after that meeting in January, we moved ahead with our alternatives analysis with this dam lowering concept in mind. We had an update call with CTUC in, in February. We then uh, embarked on a second site visit to deploy water level gauges because those gauges, um, as I said, we are tidal up to the base of the dam. And so we needed to understand that tidal fluctuation and we needed to understand it during this migratory period, which is roughly end of February or March into uh, this month, June. And uh, so we have deployed water surface um, measuring gauges, both downstream and upstream of the impoundment. There are two photos there of myself and my colleague, Jake Dittis, um, installing those gauges. And you, if you went out there now, you would, you would see that PVC pipe um, extending right down to the base of the dam. Um, and then there's another uh, installation further, um, further into the impoundment, uh, but still within sight of the, of the dam there. Um, after we did that, we, uh, we uh, then presented the alternatives analysis to the Greater uh, Advisory Council in, uh, in March and you know, discussed, answered some questions, 
left them with some tools and information uh, that I'll be presenting tonight. And, um, and here we are today, sort of uh, still reviewing um, information, now seeking your input and, and opinions on, on some of these ideas. And, um, uh, and I guess that's where we are. On the bottom pictures, the two, on the, the two fish on the bottom right, we, uh, we actually investigated the, the culvert by, by walking the entire length of it with a GoPro camera and a spotlight, and we're able to capture a heck of a lot of fish activity moving up through it. At the time, it was dark, and I was I was um, I was naively optimistic that that was uh, that was the beginning of a herring run. But it, no, it turned out to be white perch. But there were white perch and carp, and uh, and probably a handful of other species um, milling about in that in that uh, uh, in that channel there, and um, all of which uh, could potentially benefit from from this project. So, uh, next slide. So I'm going to go into these alternatives here. So the technical fishway, as I said, is a, is a prefabricated, uh, made out of aluminum. <clears throat> it comes in sections that are typically 10 feet long. They would be installed in tandem, um, notched into the probably the upper tier of this, of this spillway, and um, one to three units um, attached together till we achieve a, a slope uh, that is appropriate and passable or creates fish passable conditions for the for river herring. Next, oh, and on that left side there is an example of a project of an installation we did on a different site uh, up in Connecticut. And um, next slide. Here's another rendering, uh, an early rendering we did in this project. So three potential um, sections there attached, notched into the upper tier of the dam, also sort of notching into that lower tier meeting the ground right in front of the culvert at, at Merrick is uh, at the you know, Merrick culvert there. Um, that's one potential alignment. And then next slide. We also did these in, um, in, in CAD. So this had to be done at a two scale drawing in order to understand slopes and lengths. And I, I won't get into too, too much uh, detail there, but we looked at a, a, you know, what we call an option A and an option B, depending on um, whether we could just tie into high tide or whether we wanted to try to maximize these passage conditions by tying into all the way to the invert of the channel. So um, both of those were on the table. Uh, next slide. So the second alternative was the what's called the nature-like fishway. This is a fishway that tries to mimic a natural channel. It's not prefabricated. It's constructed by a construction crew, a contractor crew, using natural materials like boulders and cobbles and gravel. It, it's usually as, uh, assembled into a series of steps that create pools in between, a sort of a staircase effect. Um, and then it's often reinforced with concrete or, or grouting. Uh, so next slide there. Here's another rendering here with uh, boulders representing each sort of tier, each uh, step in the structure. Um, next slide. Here's another a picture of another project we did up in Connecticut. We're showing a, a nat nature lake fishway that was installed just downstream of a triple barrel culvert under an interstate highway, under Interstate 95. And um, in its various stages of construction from going from left where it's assembled but not grouted yet, then the grouting operation there with the contractor crew. And then on the far right um, is how it looks sort of finished with boulders exposed, grouting also visible, but very still very uh, sort of discreet and makes it look very natural. The gaps between the boulders create chutes that are passable for fish under a variety of conditions. And so this is generally understood to create better passage conditions than a technical fishway. Next slide, please. And again, we looked at two options here, uh, a short version and a long version. A, a, the short version um, just involving the removal of the top tier of the dam, if we could tie into, um, take advantage of high, uh, high tide elevations. Next, next slide there. And then uh, another alternative that involved full dam removal and a much, much longer, um, because you are trying to maintain a very gradual slope. The technical fishway can go much steeper, like 20% slope, but the nature like fishway has to be confined to a much flatter slope. So only a 5% slope, and that makes it, uh, in turn, a much longer structure. And um, we can, next slide. 
And then lastly, the third alternative was the dam lowering after we sort of eliminated the idea of, of full dam removal. Uh, the question still remains, what would be the optimal um, elevation of that removal? And, and with this new, um, this, the, the remainder of the water level monitoring data and some follow-up survey um, to complement the survey that we've already done, we would then try to find an elevation that maximizes the passage abilities, but minimizes the amount of sediment uh, that would have to be managed. And in this image here, we have actually shown a, a few lines of um, leading up to the spillway there. Uh, the, the black lines happen to be the water stains you see now. If you went out to the site, you would see a, a handful of, of sort of gradations of rusty colored lines that indicate high water marks. Um, after we use a, a short segment of that data that we've been collecting, uh, we go through a process with a, that ties that data into a, a local NOAA tide gauge. Uh, and the output of that are the blue lines there, which are representing mean higher high water, mean high water, mean tide level, which is right in the middle there, and then mean low water. And you can see where it interferes, where the lower tier is inundated at high tide. Uh, and that this analysis needs to be refined with the longer stretch of data that we are still collecting right now, um, but that's where those levels sit right now. So um, still um, providing some possibility that we can create fish pass conditions by um, notching the dam and, and removing only the top tier. So that um, meaning the dam lowering alternative is still, a, still an option in there. So um, next slide. Uh, yes, so I wanted to sort of give an image as to what the mill pond could look like in a dam lowered situation. Uh, if we were to take the dam down to what we think is like an original pond bottom, this is a similar scenario here of a project we did out in Pennsylvania, northeastern Pennsylvania. On the before side, it is, it is loaded with spatter dock and duckweed. Uh, it's very shallow. It's very, very long. This is a very flat um, stream. Uh, the, the full extent of the dam was removed, and that vegetation basically went through a drastic transformation, but um, where went from spatter dock, um, sort of floating, so rooted floating vegetation to emergent vegetation. It went from basically a shallow pond to a, uh, a shallow wetland, and um, not a single plant on the right was planted there. Uh, that was a completely natural transformation um, and a, a generally perceived as a very successful project with um, minimal sediment management, actually. So um, still a possibility here at, uh, at Mill Pond. Uh, next slide, please. So we're in a position to take questions, or if, if Emily, if you've received any questions, I could potentially field some right now before I move into the sort of the analysis of them, comparison of those alternatives. Yeah, that might be a good idea. Um, okay, so maybe to just touch on a couple of the questions we've gotten so far. So we'll start um, with one. So um, this might be maybe for Dan and a few others may be able to touch on this. Uh, regarding water chestnut and invasive species, it has been addressed 10 years or so ago with a huge expense to Nassau County and residents. Dredging removal and spraying at the upstream sources of Twin and Browns Pond were not addressed. It only recedes and is a recurrent problem. Will that be addressed? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Dan Fucci. Uh, the, the issue is uh, the, the, the other ponds that were referenced are not under the jurisdiction of Nassau County. Uh, so we, we don't have any authority to do any work uh, in those ponds like we do at, at Mill Pond. Yes, in Mill Pond, we did some dredging and some uh, shoreline restoration years ago. We put the biologs in and wetland plantings and so on. Uh, but the upper uh, systems that... Uh, are connected to Mill Pond, we, we do not own. I believe the uh, Twin Pond uh, Preserve is managed by the Town of Hempstead Department of Conservation and Waterways. And I believe there is some sort of a, maybe, perhaps the state owns that property, uh, but, but I believe the Town of Hempstead Conservation Waterways manages it. Uh, so so that, that's the issue there. The only other thing I, I should have mentioned before is with, with uh, invasive, uh, is the county is also looking through efforts from Senator Kaminsky's office to purchase uh, a, 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 an aquatic weed harvester. 
And uh, when we when we have that in our in our possession, when we get through all the, the grant uh, protocols and, and so on and so forth, and and you know we, we have it, uh, you know we we will be consider obviously we'll be using it in Mill Pond and Massapequa and any other pond that has issues in the future. But you know it might be an opportunity to do some sharing, uh, a municipal sharing. Uh, 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 with that uh, that harvester, so maybe you know, just as an example of, um, you know, Twin Ponds has a uh, proliferation of uh, invasive weeds, and you know the county has the harvester. You know, who's to say we can't work out some 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 sort of a, a sharing agreement uh, for a particular period of time to get that harvester in those those other ponds that aren't owned by the county, but still obviously uh, will have a benefit to the county uh, and the county as a whole. Uh, so you know. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, but when we do not have jurisdiction over other, you know, other ponds or other facilities, that kind of puts us in a position where, you know, we really can't uh, do anything about that, uh, that issue. So, but thank you for the question. Thanks, Dan. All right. So, Paul. Well, can, I, can I just add one thing, Emily? Oh, sure. Yeah. Just, just to point out that the, the problem of um, aquatic vegetation in these ponds is, is not something, there is no silver bullet for that. I mean, the, there's not one, there's no one thing the county can do. Uh, you know, the, the, the feature of open water in a pond, you know, is, is uh, nature is constantly working against that. Ponds are, are constantly uh, accumulating sediment as they get more shallow, uh, sun can more easily reach the bottom and plants grow. I mean, there are some invasive and as Dan pointed out, some just native plants are growing in that, in, that, in those conditions that we've created. Uh, so to, to maintain an open water condition that people like is an ongoing process and it, it will never stop and there's no easy way to, to deal with that. Part of what we wanted to do in this analysis was take a long-term look at the cost of the pond and the long-term cost of maintaining that open water uh, as uh, compared to some of the other alternatives. So it's a good question and a good a, a important part of this analysis. I, I would just say, Ed, uh, with Massapequa Lake, another lake that's immediately north of Merrick Road, we did the uh, uh, water chestnut harvesting in there for, I would say, five, four or five years in a row. And that, that, that uh, uh, lake was much worse than, than Mill Pond. Uh, but if you go there today, you'll see very little water chestnut. The past two growing seasons, uh, we have not even had to get the harvester in there because the water chestnut never came back. There's a very mild, small areas that have a little bit, but it's, it, you know, you can get a, uh, someone in a kayak to pretty much get rid of it. It's, it's uh, pretty amazing after about five years of treatment, it, it's, it's well stabilized now. It's, uh, it's actually, uh, you know, I, I believe a case study as to, you know, you know, I've seen other anecdotal information that says if you treat a pond for four or five years with harvesting, uh, the, the chestnut uh, kind of di uh, dissipates, you know. So I, I've been trying to get more research, do more research on that. But you know, Massapequa certainly is one of those examples where, after about four or five years of us treating it, uh, it, it has not really come back to the, to date. So hopefully, no pond will have uh, similar success. Thanks, and we going, Dan. Okay. Um, okay, I think maybe maybe we can do one more question because it is kind of relevant to what we're talking about and then maybe maybe we can move on to the next section because some of the upcoming questions I think kind of refer to the next section. Um, so Paul, can you uh, just go into a little bit more about what is head cutting and kind of why it causes issues uh, for the pond? Sure, yeah. Um, so head cutting or channel incision is basically erosion of the stream bottom. So it and to the point where it's eroding down to a a lower elevation. <clears throat> and if that were to happen, uh, or if we were to sort of take that to happen, it would it would cut the channel down deeper into the pond than it ever was before and and mobilize a lot of sediment downstream. Um, and if that's and if it's severe enough, it can move upstream and beyond the pond and and run into some issues with some of the bridges that are upstream. And so that's why it's a it's something that we look at um, pretty closely to make sure we don't create any infrastructure issues upstream, as well as the excess sediment being mobilized downstream. Great, thank you so much. And I think 
we'll just, um, I, I think if we just uh, get to the next section and talk about some of the different criteria that we're looking at, that might answer some questions. And then at the end, we'll go back and we'll um, kind of have more, more of a Q and A. So sorry for anyone that couldn't get to your questions yet. We'll get to those at the end. Okay. Right, so um, of those three alternatives, uh, we compared them across four different criteria. So the first criteria being the, the goal to increase river heron spawning habitat. The second being to, to sort of improve the overall ecological condition of Belmore Creek. The third to maintain and enhance the recreational values that are there now. Um, and fourth to improve site resilience to climate change and sea level rise. And we did this sort of semi-quantitatively where we, we um, explored each of the alternatives uh, and then assigned them a score, uh, one being the lowest and three being the highest or the best and, and went for there. So next slide and we'll move right into that first criteria. So again, the first criteria, increasing river herring spawning habitat. And we broke this out into sort of two, uh, two levels, the, the access to the habitat and the condition of the habitat. Um, uh, across the board, we found that nature-like fishway and dam lowering were nearly equivalent and slightly better than the technical fishway. The technical fishway uh, restores passage, but its, its passage uh, conditions are a little bit more challenging than, than would be created by a nature-like fishway and definitely more challenging than a dam removal uh, or dam lowering. So, um, so that's how we rated those three, two, one, uh, dam being the, the most beneficial for access and technical fishway being the least beneficial. Uh, when it came to conditions, however, um, as, as Emily had said, river herring are, is composed of two species, uh, alewife and blueback herring. Um, alewife are the only ones we, we know that are in this run, um, but blueback herring have slightly different um, preferences for spawning conditions and they, they do prefer deeper water the dam lowering would be reducing that water depth and so would not be the optimal conditions for blueback herring. Um, however, we think it would be um, optimal conditions for alewife. So uh, that's why dam lowering scored a little bit lower for the, the conditions of, of, um, of spawning. Uh, you also notice we have a column there for the weight. Uh, we, we had provided this tool to the committee so that they could, they could sort of work with it themselves. They could look at these, these different criteria that we had um, placed in here, <clears throat> and then they could increase or decrease the weight for certain criteria to say, this is more important to me, this one's less important to me. We, uh, we simply initiated uh, or provided this to them with, with only uh, one, a weight of one, and basically no, no increase or decrease, assuming they're all equivalent. And, um, and that was sort of up to the individual members of the committee uh, to, to modify those to their, their preferences. So. Uh, next slide, please. So then uh, when it comes to improving the overall ecological condition of Belmore Creek, we broke this out into a, a couple different tiers here, hydrology, water quality, vegetation community, and the and avian community or bird community. Um, now hydrology, we, um, we rated the dam, and across the board here, dam lowering scored the highest. And that's, that's not surprising in, in many, many uh, projects and in much of the research, uh, dam removal or lowering is considered to be an optimal way to restore um, not just fish passage, but other ecological functions as well. Uh, whereas fishways are, are sort of focused on the fish passage and, and don't change much else. So um, I, I mentioned that the hydrology was, was a transformation. Dam lowering would transform Mill Pond to, um, you know, to a shallow wetland as opposed to a uh, maintaining the pool depth. The technical fishway and the nature-like fishway, however, do involve lowering the water surface slightly because you have to notch that spill, spillway um, in order to create preferential flow where you need it for the fish passage conditions. So um, there is a slight reduction. Um, when it comes to water quality, uh, the fishways, we would, we would assume sort of maintain current water quality, whereas the dam lowering option um, would, would avoid the temperature increases that are happening in the summer and probably increase dissolved oxygen, both in the impoundment and, and to downstream reaches. Um, the vegetation community, as I said, would change with the hydrology. Um, what we have now is, is an invasive condition dealing with sort of water chestnut, but under the shallow wetland, we would lose water chestnut. We would expect that to sort of die back. Um, however, there is Phragmites on the periphery of this, of this impoundment and that could potentially spread. So, you're sort of swapping one invasive issue for potentially another invasive issue. And for that reason, we rated them 
uh, equivalent across that uh, community that um, the vegetation criteria. And when it comes to the bird community now, restoring fish passage brings in um, you know uh, a new food source to a lot of, uh, as we say, piscivorous birds or bird, um, fish eating birds, as Emily had said, you know, osprey and things like that. Uh, so that's definitely an increase, um, uh, a benefit to, to the bird community there. But with the dam lowering option, we would be reducing the open water area to about a two acre footprint. Um, so that would be increasing habitat for wading birds um, but and, and some shorebirds, but probably reducing some of the um, open water that's uh, used in the winter time. And I think I also mentioned that in, the, in a later criteria as well. So next slide there. Oh, and I, I, I'm sorry, can you just back up? And we do have this um, note here, um, you know, in a recent dam failure over at uh, Westbrook, you know, there, there has been a lot of data uh, about by bird, uh, birders collected and reported that shows a pretty marked increase in bird diversity at that site. Uh, ever since it was removed. And, and that, that site has some characteristics that are somewhat similar to this one. So um, again, this could be a little bit of a trade-off. Um, and that's, that's how we see this as, as potentially a trade-off between um, you know, some birds benefiting, others um, potentially being um, dislocated or something like that. So uh, next slide, please. So when it comes to maintaining and enhancing the recreational values, the three sort of primary uses we were talking about are fishing, walking, and birding. Um, and walking obviously includes all, you know, running, jogging, biking, whatever. Um, the, the fishing opportunities are going to change with the dam lowering. You would, you know, you're not going to have the same um, open water areas that had been fished. Although I, I will say I ran into a few people when I was out there who say they used to fish it and they don't anymore because it isn't great fishing. But um, I think the, those opportunities will be somewhat limited with the dam lowering um, alternative. The walking system, the trail system will remain um, basically unchanged with the technical fishway and nature like fishway. Some of the bridges may require some stabilization. The first two bridges um, upstream may require some repair or stabilization uh, once the stream returns to a free flowing condition underneath it. Um, and then, as I mentioned, birding, um, you know, this is a, a popular um, stopover site for winter waterfowl, and, uh, and that's appreciated by a lot of birders. Um, I, we would expect that that winter waterfowl use would probably uh, decline a little bit after, after dam removal. And then on the fourth, um, uh, so the fourth criteria here, improving site resilience to climate change and sea level rise, we rated dam lowering the highest here. Because um, dam lowering has the potential to reduce nuisance flooding at this location. This technical fishway and nature like fishway is sort of a status quo. Uh, and when it comes to sea level rise, you know, it's sea level rise is threatening lots of marsh um, and coastal habitats. And uh, dam lowering uh, has, a, has the potential to create that refuge habitat where uh, vegetation communities and, and wildlife communities can can sort of retreat into this area as sea level rises and in um, and, and areas that are lower gradient farther out to the shore get inundated by sea level rise. Whereas the, the fishway alternatives, they would, um, they're essentially sort of status quo and sort of limiting any sea level um, refuge habitat. And so next slide. Uh, and then we looked at sort of relative costs. Well, I'll talk numbers in a little bit. We have, we do have uh, cost ranges, but we looked at relative costs. Um, and uh, Nature Lake Fishway scores the lowest because we expect that to be the highest construction cost right from the get-go. Um, dam lowering and technical fishway are overlapping or close. Um, dam lowering potentially increased by, uh, by sediment management um, for the you know, managing sediment, depending on how low you have to, uh, we take the spillway down. Um, on the second tier, the structural maintenance, we would expect less maintenance necessary for the dam lowering than you would for a technical fishway or a nature lake fishway. Technical fishways need to be monitored. You need to inspect them. You need to clean them out. Um, so they require a bit more um, hands-on activity. Uh, and nature lake fishways are fairly robust, but when they do fail or if there is a repair, a repair needed, it's, it's, you know, it's a contractor type job. So it can be uh, kind of costly. Um, and then management of sediment, um, again, as I said, with the dam lowering, that would have probably the most substantial, and so that rated the lowest for, uh, for that category. 
And um, in the management of non-native and invasive vegetation, as I said before, we, you know, we're dealing with water chestnut now, we could potentially be dealing with Phragmites with the dam lowering alternative. So all three of those have, have some uh, concerns related to non-native vegetation. Um, and then, so can we go to the next slide? Right, so when we, uh, we scored all those, uh, added them up and dam lowering rate, uh, rated the, higher, the highest for these, and the two fishways came out um, equivalent, um, which was somewhat surprising. Um, but once we looked at numbers, then I think they differentiate a little bit. So let's, uh, it, we could take a question now, or should we just hold to the end? If I there's maybe, a question specifically yeah. about the slide, I could, I could take it now, or if not. Yeah, maybe hold to the end, and we can always move back slides. Okay, so that's, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, so that's the sort of the, the, the qual, uh, semi-quantitative scoring. And then now let's look at, uh, so the next slide is, is getting into costs. Um, we provided, you know, at this very early stage, it's really hard to get hard numbers on these things. And we looked at a variety of uh, past projects that we've been involved in, some of the projects we know of, um, thought about some of the, the, uh, the, the portions of construction that would need to happen for each of these. So looking at this first row here, fishway construction, you know, we rated, uh, we estimate somewhere on the low end of being 150,000 to up to 250,000. And when we talked to you know committee members, they they cited recent projects that were higher than um, than the 150, saying that that's probably that's probably optimistically low. Um, but the nature like fishway, we definitely expect to be significantly higher than the technical fishway. It is a larger construction project for sure. It is concrete poured. It is forms. It is it's bigger. It's um, it's a bigger operation. So uh, we that could go up to three quarters of a million easily for that project. And the dam lowering, um, that also could start out low, and it really just depends on how, um, how well we can um, position that, uh, the height of that dam um, to, re to restore passage and, and minimize the amount of sediment management. So that's, that's the, the, uh, the unknown there, um, as well as maybe some bridge protection upstream. Uh, so that puts that at the 125,000 on the low end and 350,000 on the, on the upper end. Um, and when it comes to the second row there, the management, specifically the management of sediment during construction, technical fishway, nature like fishway it would be pretty modest. I mean, there'd be more associated with nature like, but not a heavy addition to the cost. Whereas dam lowering, um, you know, if we were in the position where we actually thought we had to excavate sediment and take it off site, you know, that could really add, uh, add cost to that, several hundred thousand um, to that effort. So, um, so next slide there. Now, when it comes to structural maintenance, more of a long-term um, uh, effort, um, you know, the technical fishway, you know, is the it needs to be inspected and it needs minor maintenance throughout a migratory season. Uh, occasional need for repairs if there's damage or, or fl from flooding or debris jams, um, and you know, but somewhere on the order of a thousand to ten thousand, something like that. Nature like fishway could be more expensive because it could be a concrete repair or it could require construction equipment, something a little bit more hefty. Um, so that, that could add to that cost. And the dam lowering, we would expect to be pretty modest or pretty minor, uh, almost negligible repairs in the, in the same time frame or the lifespan of a, of a fishway. So, um, and then again, the fourth uh, row there, the management of sediment, this really varies. It, you know, the 2007 dredging operation, which somebody asked about, um, we don't have hard numbers for anymore, but uh, we heard it was sort of a, it was a three pond effort, um, and it cost about three million dollars. And um, I don't know all the costs that went into that. Uh, we did take one sample, as I said out here. It did not come back with high levels of contamination. There were some legacy uh, uh, pesticides associated with DDT, um, but they were not um, they were not alarming, and it did not indicate that you know sediment would definitely have to go to a landfill, but. It really depends on the amount of area that would need to that was be targeted for excavation and the volume of sediment that would be generated and, and how it could be managed. So it's a wide range of, for all three alternatives, depending on, on people's interest in maintaining open water habitat. Um, so anywhere from 50,000 to a million for, for sediment management, uh, those is that ballpark. And then in that, that fifth category there, which is again the management of non-native and invasive vegetation over the long term. Um, I know with the volunteer effort right now, it seems to be, it's super cheap and that's great. And, and as long as you stay on it, um, that's good. 
if you fall behind, then you start needing, you know, equipment. It sounds like the county is already starting to ramp up and get equipment, but that starts to increase the cost from, you know, uh, small volunteer efforts to something like ten to fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, and then with dam lowering again, Phragmites um, may become the concern. And and again, it depends on the size of the area that would need to be targeted. But if it was addressed early on in the say the initial construction effort with a Phragmites control effort of where the two, there's about three or three, two or three isolated pockets of Phragmites now, if they were targeted now while they were still small, this could help keep that cost on the low end of that range. But if, it, if it's allowed to spread and take over a good portion of the, of the impoundment there, then uh, you could see costs easily 85,000 for, uh, for a mobilization to deal with that. So, um, and that's a, that's a, that would be a cost per treatment. So it could get pretty pricey if it's allowed to expand and take over. Um, so what's the next slide? All right, okay, so then we added them all up. Um, so still the, the, the technical fishway kind of comes out on the lowest end, um, the nature-like fishway coming out the, on the high end of the three and dam, um, dam lowering somewhere in the middle, uh, depending on how well sediments can be um, you know, minimized or management can be contained of sediment. So um, we think those get you in the ballpark of the kind of costs you're looking at. And so when, when we looked at that semi-quantitative scoring of that put technical fishway and nature like fishway sort of neck and neck, and then you see the difference in potential costs here. Um, you know, I think the technical fishway um, sort of rises above as a as a preferential option there. Um, but again, dam lowering still has that potential to be uh, the you know the lowest in terms of um, you know a, a modest uh, upfront cost. But um, if you can if you can keep sediments uh, under control, then then really it's a, it's a good bang for the buck in terms of the ecological value you get out of it. So that's my, that's my two cents. Do we have anything else to, I forgot what that next slide was. All oh, right, so next step, next step. So if we choose an alternative uh, sometime soon, depending on which way we go, uh, we're gonna be still retrieving water level logger, loggers, analyzing data, refining the concept designs, um, and if we go with a fishway, um, we'd, we'd enter into some hydrologic and hydraulic calculations to advance a design to somewhere around 30%. And if we go with the dam lowering alternative, um, then we would also have to go through a professional survey, which would be more extensive, more sam uh, sediment sampling and analysis and develop a conceptual design that merges with a sediment sampling plan or a conceptual design that can um, address the sediment management issue. So um, that's, that is that. And I think I show a schedule on the next um, slide, right? So we started in October, 2020, went through those steps. We're here in June, 2021. Um, and our goal is to finish, all, once we've chosen a preferred alternative, um, take it as far as we can to this, um, to the completion of this project in this phase in, in November of this year. Right, and so the um, long-term outlook would be, uh, you know, this phase fizzes, uh, finishes up at the end of this year. Um, uh, ideally, we'd go to some kind of permit-ready design, 100% design in 2022, and, and look to go to construction in 2023. All right, thank you so much, Paul. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks. Fantastic pres uh, presentation and overview. Um, you can see our emails there. Before we get started um, in the another round of questions, I just want to share some resources with everyone. Um, so uh, after this meeting, um, if you'd like to kind of more formally submit your comments, I'm going to share a Google form in the chat now. You can go in there and submit your comments. Uh, please. Okay. And then we're going to collect all comments up until June um, 18th, Friday, June 18th. And then we'll kind of collect them and work with the county on a uh, final decision. Um, I'm going to put my email. Oh, let me go back. 
sorry about that. There is a link to the Google form. Um, June 18th. My email is in here as well. So if you have any comments or feedback or questions after this, you can feel free to email me. And I also just want to include um, the project website as well. The recording will be up there after, um, sometime after the presentation. So if you want to go back to it or kind of just review it again, you can feel free to hop on. Okay, so now to the question. So I want to start with one we had here. Let me go up. Okay, so this is from um, Joanne. Um, so she was uh, mentioning the Marquee Preserve is an example of no dam and it looks nothing like the pretty picture you show of the dam removal. It looks more like an overgrown area. Um, so I don't know if anyone kind of want to jump jumps in and maybe talks about, you know, the progress of kind of going from dam removal to kind of like a full type of stream restoration. Sorry, I'm looking up the preserve right now because I don't know the story behind that preserve. Yeah, um, I'm not familiar with it as well. So, it, it, was it a dammed site that's been that the dam was removed? I'm not. I don't know if that's. Let me see, um, Joanne. I'm gonna uh, push the button to allow you to talk. So, if you wanted to kind of ex um, talk more about the preserve, you'd be welcome to do that. Hey, talk. Joanne, hello. Yes, hi. Hi, welcome. Hi. Yeah, welcome. Okay, yeah, I had a lot of questions. One was when this was originally presented to us, it was for a, a ladder. And that was kind of what we all thought that was going to happen and agreed to and the different options of ladders. And then it kind of evolved to removal of dam and now lowering the dam. So I don't think the public has really been informed. I know there's been a couple of uh, something in the Herald and that. I don't. I know that the people who live around there have not been informed that that lowering the dam would reduce the size of Mill Pond. And I think most of the community is against that. I am an environmentalist and I do, but I think that the the pond is sick to begin with, and then. That should have been addressed first, as far as the invasive species. We're only addressing that now. So the chestnut pools have been nice, but that's only educational. Now we're actually Nassau County is doing what they was going to help and getting a machine to do that to make the pond more viable for the fish that would come up if you put the ladder in. We talked about the um, the nature one that was sounded nice, better than everything else. Um, and I think that's what most of the community agree to is something of more bringing them in, helping them in, but not changing. We really have a very unique pond and I know it's you know not maybe the best option, but the picture that you show of that beautiful stream, I think that's not what we'll get. We will get something like at Maroki Pond, which is only a mile down the road, right off Merrick Road that has same entrance on the Merrick Road, a little short of distance, and there's no dam. And it's just an overgrowth of whatever happens when you, you know, things grow and swamp land gets trees and brush and debris and garbage that doesn't get maintained. And then we have the same thing in Freeport at the Meadowbrook, where it's turning into, you know, there's, there's no water, there's nothing for the fish or the or the eels to live in. It's getting overgrowth and just dying. So I'm afraid that that's what would happen at Mill Pond if you, if, you know, if that's the plan. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Joanne. I really appreciate your feedback. Um, so I'll just start and please feel free anyone else um, to jump in. Um, so I know, so kind of from the beginning of this process, we did kind of have the three options outlined. We were looking at dam removal, the nature like fish passage, as you were mentioning and the technical fish passage. So we went through the exercise of like initially looking at all three of those options just to see what would be feasible. And we found that full dam removal would not be feasible. 
Um, and that, that's why we were looking into the lowering of the dam removal options. And that's why we're kind of having the public and community meeting tonight to kind of to talk about the three and to talk about, um, you know, what, what the community would prefer, prefer just as you were saying. Um, in terms of kind of the, I, I'm not as familiar with the two sites that you talked about. Um, there might be some kind of different um, environmental elements going on, especially if there, you know, wasn't a previous dam there and it's maybe more of kind of like a tidally influenced section. I'm not sure. I don't know if anyone else is familiar with those. Maybe Dan or Enrico maybe could speak to them. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not familiar with Morocco. Yeah, it's a Preserve. stream. Uh, that goes on. It, it's a stream that goes underneath Merrick Road, but uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a stream that goes underneath. It, it's a stream that goes underneath Merrick Road, but there is no spillway there. And what you will observe if you look, if you stand. You can go to Merrick Road and look north into, I guess that's the southern portion of the preserve there. It's essentially Phragmites right up to the stream channel, which I think was probably discussed in, in, the, uh, in the study before by the consultant. And it, it's pretty much textbook that as a stream channel, but it's, it's pretty much a, a, it's, a, it's just a monoculture of Phragmites right up to the stream channel. So, you know, that, that, that was discussed by the consultant as an issue if uh you know that that's one of the trade-offs and it does look like that if you if you uh, take a ride there yes there's no spillway there okay thank you so much dan um so yeah so that's something that we do have to consider um frag would definitely have to be managed there are some smaller stands there now from what we see so if dam removal lowering was to kind of come up as um, one of the final options um, that's that's kind of a management plan that would have to take place in order for us not to have it look like that and to not be a frag stand so um, we would definitely you know make sure that we had some type of management in place for that um, is there anyone else I wanted to jump in on that question before we move forward Okay, um, so let's see, we'll move on to some of the other questions we had here. Um, so we had a question about, could the interrupted fish migration pattern as a result of the dam affect commercial fishing on Long Island in any way? Um, so that sounds to me like kind of just the reduction in river herring populations altogether. Does that have an effect on kind of the commercial fishing entities? I mean, I, I would I would speak to this just generally right now is that yes, the, the damming across all of um, the eastern seaboard states has definitely caused a crash in the coastal fisheries. So um, the the only way to really restore a lot of that uh, fishery is is basically to restore a lot of the passage to to those uh, as you said, river herring or a food chain or base of the food chain kind of fish and. Um, one of the ways to restore fisheries is to is to restore the base of that food chain. So, yeah, they're very much integrated, and and dam removal is very much part of that process. Okay, perfect. All right. So for the next question, um, we talked kind of touched on this already, but I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to it a little bit more. Uh, what would be the effect on waterfowl from this project? South Shore Audubon currently and for the past 25 years has done waterfowl surveys in several ponds in South Nassau County. Mill Pond is one of the best locations for diversity in numbers. Yeah, right. So I, I did touch on it. I think, Paul, I think I may have answered your question for you. Um, it's you know, with the, the fish ways, they would be lowering water surface elevation by maybe a foot or so. Um, and, and that probably won't change the fish activity. I mean, the bird activity you're seeing there, although it's, it's sort of uncertain, we're not quite sure why Mill Pond is more active than some of these adjacent ponds that have very similar conditions. Um, uh, but the, um, the dam lowering alternative would would change that from an open water, you know, that open water habitat. And so you would 
probably see fewer of those species that are taking advantage of that open water, particularly in the middle of winter. Um, but as I said, that changes it and, and creates new opportunities for you know, wading and shorebirds and songbirds uh, that probably isn't there now. So I, I hesitate to say there'll be a, a, a net reduction in fish, uh, I mean, in bird activity. So I think um, it remains to be seen whether that, that's, it would be a true net, net loss from, from the bird community perspective. Enrico, you also had some thoughts on that last time we talked. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think it's, um, I think you know, the Westbrook uh, situation out in Oakdale has been interesting where that was a pond that, you know, did provide some overwintering habitat for waterfowl. It was not as, not as large of congregations as Belmore um, Mill Pond gets, but, gets, but um, the, the change, the diversity is really, as, as Paul said, it really expanded and, and the wading birds and shorebirds have come in and, and some of the um, vegetation that's grown supporting more um, songbirds. So, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a change from one community to another. And, uh, you know, the question of the dam, you know, the dam lowering would change that certainly. And I think the other, I think the other fishway options would have a, a minimal impact, I think, as you said, Paul, on the, on the waterfowl habitat in the winter. Thank you both. Um, my next question. So I'm not sure about this one. Uh, did the damming of various creeks along Merrick Road in the 70s address issues that could return if the dam is lowered? I don't know if Dan, you might have any kind of insight to that or thoughts. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm following the question 100% on my end. Um, yeah, so I think the road improvement project, were there any major issues that the road improvement project addressed that if, you know, the dam was lowered that could come back? I, I honestly don't know. Um, I would have to look, I would have to look into that one. I don't know that answer. I, I, I yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. No. I don't know if anyone okay. else wants to try to no, take yeah, a crack no at it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, why the, um, you know, why the spillways are put in place to kind of improve the, you know, Merrick Road itself, maybe just for stability, or I don't know if anyone has any thoughts for maybe why these kind of spillways above roads or culverts will put, might be put in yeah, my, I mean, my yeah, guess is. Go ahead, Enrico. I was going to say that. I mean, the the road pro project didn't put this didn't create the dam. The dam was there, and there was this right. pre existing spillway that may have been in disrepair and needed to be upgraded. And so, as part of that road project, it was all mm -hmm. done at one time because it was so tied into the culverts under the road, and it was just you know an improvement to the to the situation. I think. Yeah, it must have been an impoundment there anyway, because that was part of the Brooklyn Water Works uh, yep. uh, reservoir system. Yep. Uh, does Dan I think that's where that's going. I think that, that you know, the, the Merrick Road, again, I wasn't. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Dan. No. I, I think that's I think that's where we're getting at with that question. Uh, a lot of the South Shore ponds, uh, you know, were were developed or go back to the Brooklyn Waterworks uh, uh, for the New York City water supply. So there were impoundments then. So mm -hmm. the impoundments were there before the Merrick Road improvement uh, in in the 70s. Uh, you know, they may have been converted through the spillways, but there were always impoundments there for the purposes of the New York City reservoir system at the time. Yeah, and, that goes from Massapequa, the east end, and westward. Yeah, and b before that, Dan, they were they were impoundments for powering mills and other purposes, and mm -hmm. those those structures were generally built um, just upstream of the head of you know the head of tide and fresh water, mm -hmm. uh, and then the roads. You know, that's where the, then the the uh, that became the the narrowest place uh, on the waterway, which is then where the roads followed, I think, and that's how. Right across them, that's where the bridges were built. And 
So they sort of always, you know, the road and the, the, the road, the proximity of the road and the impoundments always sort of went hand in hand. So I think that's just been, when you're fixing, when you're working on one, it's easy to work on the other. Uh, this is Jeff, this is Jeff Gall speaking of Princeton Hydro. Um, <clears throat> sometimes these ponds also were constructed um, for, for uh, ice production. Um, it, it could have simply been recreational um, at the time to create a, you know, an aesthetic pond. Um, yeah, so there's a number of different issues. I would imagine that it, I'm, I can't think of a reason it would have been built to control like issues on the road because it wouldn't resolve flooding upstream. It would increase flooding. It increases flooding from the original condition and downstream. If there's a tide surge, that's not going to stop it. So I, I was going to add to that, um, that if they, um, uh, you know, as we discover that the, the channel under Merrick Road is dug deep. And um, if that was necessary at all of these channels, then the dams could have been, the, the dams that were there prior to Merrick Road could have been structurally threatened by that structure. And by, by, the, by digging those channels deep to establish Merrick Road at a certain elevation, um, and they might have had to repair those dams simply because of the, the instability that could have been creating uh, by, by those channels. That's just one theory, though. I think we'd have to do a little digging historical documents to figure out anything beyond that. It's interesting because I just went and looked at the historic aerials and the, the pond was there in 1898. So... It definitely predates the highways for sure. Yes, yeah, no, that's right. The pond's been there a long time, kind of gradually over time, supporting the mills and waterworks. And then you, I think you're right, other recreational activities, because I believe it was used for even like ice skating and stuff, such um, kind of back in the uh, early 20th century. Okay. So then we have another question here. Uh, does dam lowering risk tidal influx of salt water during hurricane, uh, like hurricane surge? I can answer that. I mean, it's it would be, uh, I mean, the whole idea also behind a removal um, would be, at least from a base flow perspective, not from a tidal surge, to, to help influence um, more of a, an estuarine a uh, system, but from a, a tide surge, from a, or a storm surge, from a hurricane, uh, that small little dam is not going to make you know uh, a difference. From like, what, for example, what Hurricane Sandy did, it would uh, almost be inconsequential, with or without the dam. Thank you very much. Um, and then we have another question. Will the pond shoreline be addressed with water lowering, preventing erosion in bog-like development? Um, so maybe that's kind of getting at a question, like if the dam um, lowering was put into place, would that then affect the surrounding shoreline? Um, it depends on what they're referring to. I mean, what we would expect to see is that the, the current uh, edge of water would would move inward and away from its um, closer to the channel. Um, and so the, those areas that are right up against the shoreline now would become you know, vegetated with um, you know, woody vegetation, shrubs, that kind of thing. And um, I don't think they would be prone to erosion. It's, it's not the type of setting where you don't have the velocities in the, in the steep slopes to be too concerned with with that kind of erosion at those locations. Um, and then as far as the bog-like development, um, well, when the erosion prevention, that, that's where the sediment management comes into play and, and establishing an elevation. If we're talking about what dam lowering here, um, establishing an elevation that can minimize the amount of sediment that would be uh, prone to erosion. Um, and then as far as bog-like development, well, Box a technical uh, type of wetland that this isn't going to be, but it would be there would be some kind of wetland development through a transition in the wetland uh, vegetation community that um, that takes the place of the spatter dock and water chestnut you have now. 
um, so that there would be some kind of a, a transition towards emergent wetland uh, community type. Um, and Paul, can you go over and uh, again, kind of how the different alternatives will lower the depth of the pond? Um, you know, we know that dam lowering will kind of more drastically reduce the depth, but how maybe some of the fishways could influence the depth of the pond as well? Yeah, I mean, it's a subtle drop. And it, it, the, the point is that like the technical fishway, for example, would have to be notched into the current spillway um, in order to make sure you've got, you've concentrated your flow um, into that into that narrow spillway, and so at some elevate at some flows in the summer, in particular, you'd see slightly lower water surface elevations than you do now. Um, the nature like fishway, the same idea. You um, you need to try to attract as much flow into that spillway into the nature like spillway in order to make it uh, to so that water depths are deep enough in the whole fishway so that fish can swim up it. Um, the only other way to do that would be to raise the dam on either side of the fishway, and we can't do that because that would just raise the water surface elevation and make it more likely to spill over onto Merrick Road. So we, we have to go down. We, we can't build up. Um, so that's, but it's a subtle, it's a subtle change. Great. Thank you so much. Emily, um, um, there, there is a nature like, I mean, I, um, a technical fishway um, of, of Steep pass installed at the one of the spillways on Massapequa Lake. Um, Dan, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any um, changes. I mean, th there had to be a lowering, a slight lowering with that installation. Are you aware of any problems that were, or, well, or complaints? Well, no, about? I don't know. I don't believe that was notched. No, there's a there's a small notch there. At that, I mean, there's a, yeah, there's a small notch on that upper sill of that spillway. I can pull okay. up a picture. Yeah. But there, so there, I'm not aware that there was any, I mean, it was very, if there was a change, it had to be very subtle. In that particular case, yeah, it was, if, yeah. if at all, it was subtle. Yeah. But that, that fish ladder has had success in returning the river herring up into the lake. Right. Okay. Um, I think we just have maybe one. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, Byron Young just um, made a quick comment that technical fishways could be shut down when not in use, which would maintain water levels during the summer and fall. So thank you, Byron. Uh, there are some other alternatives as well. Yes, that we can kind of put in place to uh, maintain some of the water levels, not during, um, and take them out during the migratory season so that the fish can move through. Thank you, you can so put much. a notch, over, a plate over the notch, I believe. Yep. I, think, I think you can put like a plate over the notch to Yep, yep. Okay. Jeff just dropped off because his internet connection broke off, but he's, he's able to get back on. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I mean, we just got an additional comment um, that returning the area to a more natural condition seems to be a net positive, and I don't think the benefit of resiliency to sea level rise and increase in biodiversity can be overstated. Um, thank you so much for that. Additional comments. And then I'm trying to see if we have any other kind of questions or comments. Um, Joanne just asked again, kind of what picture, what was the picture of the stream we showed earlier? I can pull up the presentation to just look again at the name of the stream. Okay, I'm just gonna pull that into this. So it's Rakes Dam Removal in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, but I mean, we also have a prime example right on Long Island, kind of of what a kind of dam removal or in the case dam failure would look like. Um, Westbrook is kind of a really interesting um, example of kind of what a stream system can look like after a dam failure. 
sorry, Emily, I muted myself when I was uh, speaking, but yes, yeah, so Rakes Dam in Northeastern Pennsylvania, and I forget the exact name of the town. I could, I could look it up. It'll take me a, a minute or two to, to get that, get that up. The, the reason why I chose that one is because it was an, an impoundment that had so much vegetation in it, spattered knock and, and duckweed, and it made me think of, of this site. And that's, uh, that's the, because it's so shallow and, mm -hmm. um, that's the similarity to this. Great. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any kind of last minute questions they want to type into the chat or put into the Q&A box? Oh, okay. Byron kind of made another note that another example of kind of um, where a dam failed um, and kind of how the stream um, kind of came back was Sunken Meadow Dam, or Sunken Meadow, where the dam washed out during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, so thank you for that, Byron, as well. And we have some pictures. I know Westbrook, um, we have a, a web page on that on our website. If you're just kind of interested to see what that looks like um, today, kind of after the dam failure as well. All right. So I think we're getting close to 830. So I don't know if um, Enrico, Paul, Dan, anyone kind of want to make um, just some final last comments, closing remarks before we kind of say goodbye. No, on behalf of the county, I just want to thank everyone for their uh, input tonight. And uh, we, have, we have things to consider. And uh, I think this was a productive uh, meeting and get together. So I just want to thank everybody for their uh, input. Okay. Uh, yes, just to echo that. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining tonight. We really appreciate the feedback that everyone can kind of bring to this project. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have a Google form available where you can offer, offer kind of some more formal feedback. If um, so We're just going to try to collect those all by next Friday, June 18th. And then we'll kind of summarize everything and uh, present it to the county to, for their consideration. Um, and if you have any questions or feedback or want to have a chat about anything in the meantime, please feel free to email me. Um, and then all of the resources, again, will be available on our website, ctech.org, under the Benmore Creek um, webpage. Um, thanks, Dan, Paul, Enrico, um, Ariel, and uh, Jeff as well. <laughs> and um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good Thanks, night, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye now.